The Doll Maker is a film that is near and dear to my heart. It was adapted or made from a book by Harriet Simpson Arnow. And it really tells the story of a lot of people who in the 40s, 50s, and subsequently the 60s found themselves leaving Appalachia to go into manufacturing communities. And it's, it's something that is continuing today. Um, when I think of this film, and it was one of the reasons that I wanted it for this series, is because it brings up questions. On tonight's panel, you will have myself and John Polly, both of whom were part of the great diaspora out of Appalachia in the 50s and 60s. And Joshua Wilkie, who is a younger generation who stayed and, and made his life here. And so we're going to have, hopefully have some interesting insights, but I want you all to, in, I don't know if I can say enjoy the film, but I hope the film resonates with you and we'll see you on the other side to talk about it. Well, I am delighted that all of you are, are here this evening and that you have participated in this film series. When we started this series, we wanted to shine a light on Appalachia. We wanted to look at issues that impact us. We wanted to look at the history and we wanted to walk away with a greater sense of who we are. So before we start the discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit with our two panelists. I'm really honored to have John Polly and Dr. Joshua Wilkie join us for this evening to, to talk about the film and the issues that the film brought up that are still things that we are dealing with today. Before I ask them to introduce themselves, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I grew up in Campbell County in Stinking Creek, Tennessee and went to Wynn High School. Um, when I was 15 years old, I hit the road to go to college and became one of the great diaspora of the 50s and 60s, the young people who left Appalachia and didn't come back for many years. So um, as Deborah said, I study Appalachian culture, which is somewhat ironic given that I was so eager to go when I was younger but there is much to admire about our people. We are strong, we are resilient, and we are honest to a fault. I'd like to, first of all, ask John Polly uh, to talk a little bit about himself. John is a resident of Campbell County, but originally from Kentucky. And he is a wood artist, and we invited him to be on this panel first because, again, he is part of that generation of people who are in the great diaspora, but also because he is a wood artist, and we thought that he would have a connection with, um, with Gertie. And when John has finished speaking, then I would like Joshua Wilkie to talk a little bit about himself. I met Joshua over the phone and over the internet because I was looking for somebody who would refute 
J.D. Vance's book about Appalachia. And I came across an article that said my mother was a white trash. And if you haven't read that article, that essay, please go look it up and do so. It is a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. So John, we're gonna start with you and then then Josh. Oh, I, 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 get, I guess I get to big screen now, huh? Yes, we wanna see your face. <laughs> well, well, first of all, thank you, Fran, for inviting me. Thank you for the university. Uh, this is, for me, an honor and a privilege to kind of talk about my roots and about uh, some of my hurdles in life that I've been through. And, Doctor, I read your article. I don't normally get emotional and cry, but I did. That's a powerful piece of literature. It really is. But anyway, so I grew up in southeastern Kentucky, right at the edge of the coal fields. Uh, my dad was a sharecropper, so you know, we, we raised tobacco, and half of the tobacco crop went to the owner, and that paid our rent. Uh, we're, we grew all of our food. I was one of seven children that grew up in that household. Uh, there was actually, it's confusing family. There was actually 13 children by two different marriages. So, but it, it's complicated. Uh, I left home at 18 to work on a farm. At about 20 or so, I started working construction in Lexington, Kentucky, which was a 50 mile commute each way. Uh, I did that till I was about, uh, well, 35. At 35, I got a job working with the federal prison system and moved around there uh, several times, always in the mountains. I've been in the mountains my whole life, Kentucky, Tennessee, and four western Maryland's where I've lived. Got married in 1985. I have two wonderful kids. Uh, after I retired, I... Uh, Worked at Lowe's part-time, just, uh, I told folks, purely for entertainment. But but I met a lot of people there, and, and I got to know a lot of the people here. I also worked uh, home repairs. I did a lot of home repairs during that time. And then in 2018, I met this lovely lady. Uh, uh, her name is Fran Day. And she invited me to be a part of Aramont. And... Uh, I've been part of Aramont since early 2019. I had the great honor of doing the Appalachian Cultural Fellow. At, uh, and what I did, that was a three-month program, of course. And uh, I, I tried to revisit the old ways, the old tools, the old ways, the old methods. But that's what I grew up with, and I understand those. Uh, today, I work full-time with uh, I guess you can call it arts and crafts and wood. I teach a lot. I've, uh, I've got several teaching venues I do. But the Appalachian people, I was telling Deborah yesterday, that's my people. So thank you all. Josh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to say thank you, first of all, for having me on this wonderful panel. Uh, the movie <clears throat> is very moving. And, and also, thank you, John, for the kind words about my essay. You know, that, that essay came at a time where I was frustrated about the way my people were being depicted on the national yes, scene. I'm, because I'm a son of Appalachia, too. I've lived here my entire life. Uh, I am currently sitting in the dining room that was my grandparents' bedroom. Uh, my son, who you might have seen on the screen a few minutes ago, is the fourth generation of our family to live on this land in this place. And we were just really lucky that we were able to buy it from other members of my family just before he was born about five years ago. And so we do a lot of Appalachian things here, right? We uh, we have fruit trees and we have an assortment of farm animals at various times. And and we really like to be connected to, to this place in this land, right? Because that's important. Yes. And so, you know, growing up here, deeply mired in poverty, the college was not an option for me at 18. And I tell the story that uh, when I was about 16, I went to Brevard College for all district band and I fell in love with the campus. And I said 
to my mamma when I got home, hey, I'm going to go to Brevard College and I'm going to major in religion. And she just looked at me and she said, why the hell do you think you can do that? We are not college people. And yeah. so yeah. long story short, I went to work and ended up in Eastern yeah. Kentucky as a small business owner in Middlesboro. And after the Great Recession, I was working twice as hard for half as much money. And I decided that if I could get out by the skin of my teeth and live for about a year, I was going to go to college. And so I worked yeah. in, uh, I walked into college at 31 for the first time and I've not left since, right? I went straight on through. And uh, as you can see by my logo, uh, a few years after that uh, journey into college, I returned to Brevard College as a professor. And so, um, you know, my grandmother and I didn't have a relationship at that point. So I never got to sort of say, hey, we are college people, right? And I've sort of um, just found my place and, and grown there, right? And I've been there about eight years. I'm an associate vice president now. And I love to teach about, uh, I teach about, about a variety of things, but Appalachian Studies is one of those things that I teach. And so that's sort of me in a nutshell. Well, you know, when I think about it, I think all of us in some way or other were told we either weren't college material or, hey, we poor people, we don't do that. You need to get a job in the shirt factory. And many of the people I went to school with did. The thing that struck me as each of you was talking, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about it in the context of the movie, was Gertie had a dream. And when I think about the fact that, you know, we are continuing to lose young people out of Appalachia, I, I wonder is 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 the dream is are we losing the ability to give our young people and our children that dream that dream that's going to hold them here you know thinking about gertie hung on to that dream all the way through all of those trials and tribulations Ah, uh, well, I'll, I'll start. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the theme of the movie, you know, dream of a better time. Uh, and at a, at a young age, for myself, I could see that there was a better way, a better way. And, and, and I desired in my heart, even at seven or eight year old, I'm going to get this better way. You know, and as you said, there was very little encouragement from the people uh, with power and money, I guess you would say, the, 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 the who's who's of the community. They expected us to be poor and stay poor. In fact, is I was told that you're poor, you'll always be poor. You, you know, you, you'll never make it here. You know, all these things I was told. And then, are we losing that dream? I, I don't know. I mean, you still see success stories uh, of course, drugs, you know, drugs is prevalent now, really bad, and that, that that hinders the dream, of course. But you have to have a dream, and you have to pursue that dream with absolute persistence. So then it's my duty and our, our duty to get people to understand that. You, you must have a dream. You must have a desire. And, and you got to have this persistence. It don't come overnight. And that's, you know, with the young young generation, you, you see that a lot. I want to be successful overnight. Well, it took me nearly 40 years to be successful. So it, it's time and persistence. Josh, you're not I, your head. I, I would agree with that completely. You know, there, the great tragedy of our region is that generation after generation, there is something that is inflicted on our people. I, I used to think that Appalachian people had the worst luck of anyone on this continent. And then I learned a lot and realized that's not necessarily the case, right? It, it, and then one of the things that made me realize that it's not necessarily the case is that sometimes having a class of people, working class people who are poor, who are addicted, who are stuck in poverty, that is a feature of the system often and not a bug, right? 
there are people with a vested interest in keeping that class of people in Appalachia because they are reliable labor forces. They yes. are reliable yes. voters. They are reliable cogs in a machine that has never benefited them. I, I describe Appalachia as a rich land with poor people. And I'm not the the one who came up with that. Um, the, they're the, the deans of Appalachian history, right, who coined that phrase. But But I think as we think about what our dream is, a dream often when I was growing up, it, when my mama told me I couldn't go to college, she said I needed to go to work at a restaurant because people are always going to eat or I need to become a nursing assistant because people are always going to need health care. So, so that for her, right, was the dream. It was a steady income. It was um, even a tiny income, right? It was some semblance of stability. And I know there are other places yes. in central Appalachia, especially where the dream is just to be able to get a social security disability check. That is the goal, right? And so yes. I think we have to dig deeper for our children and let them know the dream is whatever you want it to be, but you have to fight for it. And it's just what John said. It takes time. It takes dedication. It takes effort. It takes blood, sweat, and tears. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what the magic formula is, but I know that those of us who made it out, right, often make it back in. And, you know, it, my dream growing up often was to leave Appalachia. And our greatest export is human beings. And they make that point early on. You know, when, when that soldier asks her, what do y'all grow around here? Children to send off to your wars. Yes, children to send off to your lumber industry. Children to send off to your coal mines. Children to send off to work in your tourism businesses in Gatlinburg. Those are the mm -hmm. examples, right? And so I think right. those of us who have the privilege to have, through usually through the kindness of other people, right, to have found yes. our way, it's our absolute absolute obligation to be sure that our our kids know what our culture is, know what our values are, and they're not the values that you see it, it espoused the most loudly in in this culture, right? And so I think it right. starts with letting our kids know who we are and why this place matters. One of the things that has always struck me, both in the book, and if you haven't read the book, I do encourage you all to read it. It is a powerful piece of work. But one of the things that has, that struck me was the resilience. The resilience of not just Gertie, but all of those poor people who were trying to make their way out of the projects. And it has always struck me that being, I am both Eastern Bend Cherokee and, and Appalachian. And the thing that has always struck me is that we persist. And so I'd be interested in hearing how, when you all saw, looked at the movie, what were some of the themes that emerged for you? Either one of you, don't all talk at once. I'll let John so, go first. So you're, you're, you're asking about the persistence? Uh, I, I guess that, that's your... Uh, general question here how were they persistent i well, mean they no, were my determined. question is what themes did you see that struck you as being particularly appalachian in nature well i mean, I mean she was very per per persistent she she had her ways she had you know when, when he brings in the bandsaw and all these paints she said, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. That's not the way I want to do it. You know, she, she, she had her way of doing things, and that's how it was going to be. She uh, obviously didn't like the city, and uh, that was a detriment to her. It really was. I mean, she would have been more, and she was, of course, more content, more happy to be back home among things she's familiar with and among her people. So so the, you see that, I mean, and in Josh's article, he talked about uh, uh, re, re, you know, the religious groups wanting to save the people and that'll make them all better. And I was thinking about this today and I don't know who y'all's religious affiliation, it really doesn't matter. I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say, 
But most churches, their goal is to support the church building and the pastoral staff. They will take a meal to the poor people at Christmas and think they've done their duty by those people. I mean, and I go to church, but but that's the mentality of the church. And I'm sorry I got off topic, friend, but but I had to throw that in there while it was on my mind. You know, I, well, I think that I think that is an God. important theme of the film, right? That there's this undercurrent there. It, to me, one of the most beautiful parts of the film is when she's first talking to her mother about her brother dying, and she talks about not the ways he might have fallen short according to their religion, but by the ways that her brother resembled Jesus. She talks about him being with the little children and going to the wedding feast and Jesus with a smile on his face. And and we are missing that in Appalachia now, that understanding of Jesus as Jesus was, not as people have come to portray Jesus as a, a, a political or a nationalist figure, right? And so one of the things that I see there is the way that people understand how they see their religion portrayed in their communities. And, and it's throughout Appalachia without having a name on it. Once we've put a name on it and made it about the building and the person standing in the pulpit screaming every Sunday, that's where we fall short, right? Yes. And so yes. ultimately, you know, as I think about the themes of the film, I in the first 10 minutes of the film, you see all of the stereotypes of Appalachia, certainly as they existed in the 60s and 70s, right? And then you see yes. this beautiful debunking of it without it being debunked, right? People in Appalachia are portrayed as ignorant, and yet they are not, right? People right. are portrayed right. as um, as lazy, and yet they are not. People are portrayed right. as, uh, name any character flaw you can, and it has at some point been foisted upon the people of Appalachia. But over and over again, right, they demonstrate that they're creative. They demonstrate that they're enterprising. They demonstrate that they have a larger love and affection for uh, their kinship groups than most other cultures. And I think that is just incredibly important. And you see that throughout uh, the film. And, and the other thing I'll say, that the last thing I'll say as far as themes go, you have this intergenerational um conflict, I will say, between um, the younger people who want to do things their own way and the older people who just have this idea that this is the way it has to be. And I think every subsequent generation in Appalachia has had to, at some way, be at odds with our grandparents because our way of doing things is a little bit different. And um, yes. you know, when I think about my memo and I, I think about my concept of radical inclusivity as the way of understanding the world and the way of raising our, our kid to be radically inclusive, that has a political undertone now. And, and yet my thought about it is not any different than my memos would have been. And yet she would not have, have operated, I don't think, in, in the way that we do, in, in the way that people who are like her would now, right? She was radically inclusive right. too. She's the reason I learned it, right? And, and yet we have to do it our own way, right? And I think every generation in Appalachia faces that. I just wanted to say that there was a comment from one of our audience members, Karina Graves said, that I think applies to John and Josh, what you were just describing. Karina says, I really enjoy the symbolism of the Jesus piece being cracked up and turned into whittled art. The idea of rebirth and the family having a chance to restart their roots, especially since Easter has just occurred. So I think that you're kind of speaking to the to the symbolism and to the themes of that. Yeah. So right. sometimes you have to tear the church down to rebuild it because it's not a building. And I think that applies writ large, right? That applies to community, that applies to kinship, that applies to family. You know, one of the things that struck me, and every time I see this film, I something else strikes me that that didn't before and maybe I can only keep one idea in my head at a time but but the way the people these poor people and the projects these working people took care of each other and I see that in this community 
uh, which is a very small community. I think we have maybe uh, 2,500 people in the county at most, if that, and we have 450 or 500 people in the town. And recently, when my husband died, I swear one of them cooked something and brought it to me. So one of the things that I think that is still very prevalent in Appalachia that we don't think about is how we take care of each other. Even when you don't like somebody, if they hit on hard time, you take care of them. You know, you may be saying bless their heart all the way to taking care of them, but but I think that's that's an important value that just kind of struck me as I was watching the film again tonight. What other things did you all see in it about Appalachia? So I noticed that um, Karina also has a, a comment there in the chat, a question about how we feel about the term hillbilly. And um, I take it a step farther. Uh, anyone who's read my work knows that I embrace the phrase white trash. And I catch a lot of flack from it. Um, I very rarely catch flack from it by someone who's ever been called that because people understand. And, and one of the reasons that I say hillbilly or white trash out loud and identify that way is because I, there are words mean things and there are powerful thoughts in words. If you identify yourself as white trash, it makes people who called you that understand the power of that, right? It, 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 and so to me, I, I don't look at it as a slur or as derogatory. I look at it as a way of reminding you that you may often have portrayed me in that way, in a way that dehumanizes me. And so I, I think we have a lot to be proud of as a culture. And I think that part of striving for equity and, and equality in Appalachia, as we understand it, is by understanding that, um, you know, my papa said, we all put our britches on one leg at a time, right? And I think there's some Bye. power in, in that, right? And, and in the film, you know, you see examples of, of that. There is, you know, e even the person in the film, early in the film, uh, the the uncle, right, that she's going to buy the, the home from, that is someone who is at a perceived position of power in the community. And you see that power exercised a little bit differently, I think, in Appalachia than you do in other places. I'll also note that that's the insider, right? Uh, unfortunately, there's this insidious uh, sort of outsider relationship that doesn't have as kind uh, a force to them, right? And so that's one of the things that I think of as the great insider outsider, um, powerful conversation in Appalachia. One of the things that I am reminded of, Josh, as you're talking, is when I met John Polly, and it was in a field. We were talking about the school where I worked at that time. And John came up to talk to us. And um, one of the things that, that happens, I think, and is that everybody that I meet in Appalachia, who is homegrown, so to speak, has a hidden depth. And maybe everybody has a hidden depth, but I I remember, you know, we're talking to John and we ask him, well, do you do you do anything with art? And he said, no, nah, no, I work with wood a little bit. And we said, do you have pictures? And he showed us pictures and he was a master of the craft and turned out to be a great teacher you know, it's these these hidden depths that I like to look for in in my friends and my neighbors. And so as I looked at the um, I looked at these these people and each of them had one shining strength and one major flaw. But I think the shining strength outweighed the major flaw. 
John, you start to say something. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and what you're saying is, is right in many respects because uh, many people in the Appalachian region, they do have a lot of talent. They just need someone to encourage them and expose that talent because, you know, we, we typically tend to be humble people. We don't brag about ourselves. We don't do all those things. But if someone encourages encourages us and says, hey, like you did to be in that field, hey, that's pretty good. Well, you know, for me, that's just woodworking. That's nothing spectacular. But then you saw it as something different. So if we can take, and I try to do that with students when I teach, I try to look at the student that's that thinks they can't and then work a little harder with that student and then at the end, by the end of the class, many times the student will say, oh, my gosh, I did this all by myself. I didn't think I could do this. So, you know, again, back to words of encouragement and trying to find where that talent is in those individuals. So coming back to the central theme of this this film and even going back to the first film in the series, Wild River, where we are dealing with the idea of leaving and the idea of displacement. I'm wondering how do you all see that happening today and do you have ideas about what we might do as people who are charged, all three of us are teachers or educators in one way or the other, what can we do to, to make, make the young people not do what I did, uh, which is flee at 15, John at 18, and even you, Josh, went into business rather than following your passion. So what do we do? What what do we take away from all of this? I, I think the thing that weighs heavy on my mind right now, our people have to have somewhere to live. And and I, I don't know what it's like in, in, I know what it's like in central Appalachia because I've lived there. I don't know about northern Appalachia, but around here, none of us could afford to buy our houses again. And our young people who we graduate from college want to stay here. They want to come back and work at the college. They want to go to grad school at the college. They can't because every free piece of space in the county is an Airbnb now that rents out to $200 a night. And, you know, it, it, the, the sort of the line that I use is that growing up, it was, you know, you need to work hard and you need to get a good job or you're going to be living in a van down by the river. And now it's, if you work hard and get a six figure salary, you might be able to afford a van down by the river, right? I, it is impossible here for us to pass along this place because people can't afford it, right? And I think that's one of the things that I see as a major disruption. I, I have started to think about tourism. Tourism is great in a lot of ways. Tourism is as much a taking as the coal industry or the lumber industry in a lot of ways. It is a taking of the resources that we have reclaimed, right? So they first they came for the lumber, then they came for the coal. And when they were done with that, they sort of left it, but now they're coming to exploit that resource through tourism. And again, it it continues to be a rich land of poor people. The, the people who talk the way we talk are the ones who are the servers or the ones who are um, working in the, uh, the amusement industry or um, working as laborers, right? And so we have to find a way for our kids to be able to live in this region because it it has always been bought and sold to the highest bidder and we are never the highest bidder. And this it, it, tourism and and the the influx of people moving into Appalachia um, is just the next generation of that, I think. I think this is where I make a plug for my university, which works, educates young people to be movers, shakers, leaders, activists in their community. So I'm just going to put that out there. And if anybody wants to know more, you can either call me or go to our website. 
and the commercial is over. So Deborah, are you ready to start asking, uh, inviting others to join us to talk? I am. So we're going to start. So you, so everyone who's participating, you're going to get an invitation to join us on screen if you like. But in the meantime, I would love to ask the panelists to consider a question kind of on the other side of what you just discussed. Uh, Jamila Jens Fleet asks, um, or she comments that John is picking up on Gertie being happy when she was on her way back home at the end of the film. Jamila thinks that it's impor an important Appalachian characteristic, and we are seeing the diaspora returning home, like with John, like with Fran, um, and maybe others in the audience. So Jamila asks, how can we provide pathways for returners to be impactful? I think that's a great question. And, and I think th the word that we don't think of because it seems like jargon or academics is diaspora. The very definition of diaspora is a community in exile, community in exile, not individuals in isolation in exile, but a community in exile. There are critical masses of Appalachian people in Detroit, in Chicago, uh, in Washington and Oregon who moved out with the lumber industry, right? But they're still a community and that community is still here, right? And I think that's incredibly important for us to preserve what our community is. I, if our kids leave or our grandkids leave and they come back and they don't see what it was that they loved about growing up here, that's a problem, right? And they're not going to want to come back because it's not the same thing. And, and you know, you, you can't go home again or not, and all that, right? But we have to preserve enough of our culture, the way our grandparents and great grandparents did things that, that we all have an affection for that people, we have to have something worth coming back to. Yes. Yes. I agree, Josh. The other thing I think that we have to do is to make sure that we are welcoming. You know, we need to, um, when I first came back 10 years ago, after having been gone, I won't tell you how many years, but it was a long, long time. Um, people were a little taken aback that I would come back. That, and so sometimes I didn't always feel welcome. You got above your raising. I got above my raising. And it wasn't that they weren't proud of me. They were enormously proud of me. They just didn't think I belonged there anymore. It is the great catch 22 that that I struggle with all the time because I'm passionate about getting students to college and many of them are going to want to go to college outside our region. And I think they should. We have some amazing educational institutions in Appalachia. There's the Appalachian College Association that many of us are members of that does important work. A lot of our students are going to need to go outside of our region if they want to go to medical school, if they want to go to veterinarian school, if they want to go to law school they need options outside our region. And we have to look at that as a welcoming of that talent and that knowledge and invite them to employ that in our own communities. I think you're exactly right, Fran. Yeah. Well, and, and, the, and, and, and the problem, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Uh, no, you know, and, and some of the problem of that I see, Doctor, is you know, like where I grew up, you know, people with power and money, even if you come back, they're not really going to accept you back once you've left. I mean, it, it's tough. I mean, for me, when I left, when we left moving with the Bureau of Prisons, we knew when we left, we're not going back. I mean, we just knew that. I mean, we're still in the mountains, of course, and we've always lived in rural areas, but we're in a different... These people here didn't know us all of our lives. So they were more uh, accepting and welcoming welcoming to us to become here. Had we went back where we were, I feel like it would have been like, well, that's just that old Polly boy, you know, he's, he's poor, he ain't got nothing. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I think you're exactly right because again, living in the house that 
was the only place that was home to me growing up. I, I have family members that live a mile away that I never speak to. And part of it is that strife of saying you went away and you came back. Uh, you chose education. You went off and got a doctorate. You went to grad school. You're a professor and we don't understand that. You think you're smarter than us. And I, you know, I, I do things just, just the way they do, right? I, I don't code switch anymore. I sound Appalachian again, right? I got away from that for a long time because I was embarrassed by it until I realized it's nothing to be embarrassed of. Um, so I, I think yeah, you're I worked right. very hard to, to erase my accent. And then as soon as I wasn't mm -hmm. where I didn't have to have, didn't have to work on it, it came right back. So, you know, um, I mine back the first time I ever had a, an Appalachian good old boy in one of my college classrooms. And um, he asked me where I was from. And I just thought it should be self-evident where I'm from. I'm from here. I'm from Appalachia. One good old boy to another. He didn't see that in me. And, and that right. really hurt me and made me realize I, I, I have done something wrong here it, it, in a way that's not going to foster the next generation of Appalachian people being proud of who they are. Deborah, do you have other questions or comments? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Karina. Thank you guys so much for answering my questions and reading my comments. Um, I really like the conversation just about um, the dream and then having like talking about the youth and like how to keep them coming back to Appalachia. And I think that was very evident mm -hmm. um, in the film with uh, one of Gertie's uh, sons who was like, I just can't do this anymore. Like it just became too much for him. And he continued the dream and went back home early. Um, so I guess my question to you is like, how are we incorporating these stories to the youth or to younger generations? And when they do leave, bringing them back in a way, cause I know like, I definitely want to go back home as an adult, but like, how are we keeping those resources alive for the people that do want to come back? You know, one of the things that we do that is not popular as a higher education institution, we absolutely interview for fit when we hire faculty and staff. And what that means is we need people who understand our communities and often people who are from our communities. If we want to have a higher education world that's more reflective of our community and all its diversity and, and eccentricities even, we have to send those people off and we have to welcome them back with jobs. And so we very often will hire people, if not from our section of Appalachia, from other places in Appalachia, because they understand that, right? And so I think institutions that have power have an absolute obligation to offer pathways for people to come back. Uh, we need to send them off to learn what they need to. Um, you know, we send people off to be chemists and physicists and historians and literary critics and um, musicologists. We need to invite them back to have that talent in our communities. And so I think that's why the higher education landscape is so important, right? There are so many diverse institutions of higher education across Appalachia with, with varied missions across the spectrum. And I think we don't focus enough on the, the robust intellectual community of universities as a way of welcoming and affirming people who are from here and went away. It, we, we don't need to be in an elite ivory tower. And, and I think we need to dispel that, but we need to let people know that their intellect is welcome here as well. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm Frank. reminded of John Rice Irwin who founded the Museum of the Appalachia and uh, who was an amazing Appalachian scholar. And when I was graduating from high school, John Rice said to me, Francis, leave, go far, learn, and come back. And I'm so grateful that I came back before he died so I could thank him for his advice. But I think that that's what we're looking at, that we need to do is we need to give people permission. You know, Clovis had a dream too. Yes. It never occurred to him to ask his wife what her dream was because by virtue of being a white male, he had 
advantage and power. But he had a dream mm -hmm. and he discovered that his dream was not being realized because what he wanted to do was not what his people wanted, wasn't what his, yeah. so, you know, that's part of it too, is we need to give our children, our young people permission to fly, but we want them to be like the Sankofa bird. We want them to go forward, but we want them to be looking back mm -hmm. and carrying who they are in that fragile egg in their mouth. Mm -hmm. you you know, know, one of my favorite okay. moments as a, a professor is when I get to see the moment when someone starts living their dream instead of their family's dream. They come to yes. college with a very clear idea of who they are and what they want to do because that's what's been imposed on them since day one. And, and a lot of it is a lofty goal, right? I want to go to law school. I want to go to medical school because I have this obligation to go from nothing, from being a first-generation high school graduate. I have to do it all. And my family said, I have to go to law school or medical school. They don't want to do that, right? And, and at the moment when we can let them see their dream, one of my favorite stories is I, I was working with, with a young man, and I was his advisor. And my advisees are all business and organizational leadership majors. And so I was working with him. And he kept putting off accounting. And I finally said, Carson, you have to take accounting next semester or you can't graduate on time. And he just said, I, I don't want to do it. And so I just asked him, I said, when are you going to start living your dream, whatever it is, or at least share that with me? Because this ain't it. And I called, mm -hmm. I said, he said, you know, my mom's been sort of saying that too, but I think I should be a business major, but I can't tell you why, because I don't know. And I said, why don't you leave and come back in a couple of days when you know what your dream is? And um, his mother was a bit of a helicopter parent, right? So someone who had me on speed dial and I just called her and I said, hey, you need to help Carson figure out what his dream is. And, and she said, I, I, he does, he needs to do that. And it turns out he wants to be a coach. We switched his major to phys ed and he graduated in December and he's delightfully happy because he's learning, he, he's living his dream. And he returned to his own community to be a coach because coaches were so instrumental in lifting him up and getting him to college. We just have to figure out how do we mentor these students to make sure it's their dream they're, they're living. We have to give them space for that. Deb, more questions, comments? Yeah, well, Betsy Taylor has a question about education, but uh, a different form of education that she observed in the novel and in this film, she says, one of the things I loved about the novel is the way in which it portrays the wealth of knowledge that Gertie has, her artistry, her ecological knowledge, and her healing skills. It's knowledge that doesn't come from a quote unquote formal education. It came from the work of her hands uh, and from generational transmission. So Betsy is wondering what all of you think about the role that Appalachian living arts and crafts might play in holding our young people um, in and around education. And I know John- I think John ought to answer that. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's my, you know, I made it out. I, I did okay in life. So now it becomes my duty to show others how to do this. So, and I can do that through teaching, like I you know, like uh, said earlier there. You, you take the student that thinks they can't, that, that has no hope, and you make them have hope, even just for that moment. I mean, I, I can relate back to some of my teachers in school, specific moments that was life-changing for me. And an example of that, was my, my health class in high school, the first test I failed, made an L. The teacher called me to her desk and she said, John, you can do better than this. The next test I made an A. The third and fourth test, she stood behind me and watched me because she thought I was cheating. But again, it was that word of encouragement, John, yes, you can. And now, you know, I have countless examples, and most of them were educators that said, you can. So I think that's the message we need to tell these young folks. Yes, you can. 
I'm reminded of a story John told me after his first teaching gig for us. I said, well, how did it go? And he said, I cried today. I said, what do you mean you cried? These were little kids. He said, no. He said, this little boy came up to me and he, John was teaching them how to make spatulas. And he said, look, Mr. John, I did it yeah. all by myself. By myself. Yeah. You, you know, for me, he he could. for me, this is this is what it, what it means. This is a few weeks ago. My son and I were camping and I'm teaching him to whittle because I think it's important that he learn the things that I learned to do with my hands. I, you know, live, living on a small farm, if something's broken, we fix it. Right. Or if I want to, uh, my wife pokes fun at me a good bit because we'll see something. I'm like, well, I could probably make that. I think that is an, an innately Appalachian thing, right? To think, oh, I could make that or I could do that, right? I don't need to go to Lowe's and get that. I have something I could use for that. Yes. But I think it's important. You know, I, the things that we teach our kids, I, I think that we have to pass down that hands, hands-on hands knowledge. I'm, I'm very big on yes. experiential education. I, you know, I want my son who loves the outdoors, we spend a lot of time outdoors. I want them to know how to build a fire. I want them to know how to whittle. I want to know how to make a spoon or, you know, carve something or just do something that's cathartic. You know, I wrote my, um, all, all of my research during my, my master's degree, I wrote at the lathe. Um, I would turn, I don't know how many bowls and I don't know how many pins, but that's what I did, right? I have to have something, some outlet. And so wood turning was my outlet for my master's degree. Farming was my outlet for my doctorate, it, this doesn't work for me if these are not working, right? And, and I think it's important for us to realize that you don't have to choose one or the other. True, true. And I think, John, one of the things to get back to Betsy's question, really we're talking about applied knowledge and self-education. And much of your education, John, has been self-education. You set out to learn it. Yes. And I think it might be interesting to hear a little bit about that and how how it played into to your life and your career. Okay. So a good example, when I started working construction, the guy who I was working for at the time told me this. He said, John, this is all you'll ever be able to do. I was told that. So on the construction jobs at lunch, I would go get to where the plan tables were and I would study those plans and I would go look to, you know, plan versus what was built, plan versus what was built. When the job was done, if there was an extra set of plans left, I'd take them home with me, and I would study those. So I learned how to do all that, the layout, the, how, how things were built, which, which, led, which allowed me to run my own crew. At one time, I ran 100 men crew in my early 20s, but only because I applied myself. Some of my fellow neighbors, family, and friends, they started at the same place I did at the same time. They never made it because they wanted to work their eight hours, take their 40 minute lunch and go home. You have to, in my world, because I don't have a college education, y'all. I had to apply myself, work with my hands and learn it by myself. Same way with woodworking. My, my, my dad taught me some basic stuff. But then through trial and error and a lot of, a lot of failures, uh, and I still don't consider myself a master friend, but I'm, I've gotten better at woodworking. So, yeah, I mean, you have to have this mindset, and somehow we got to teach people this mindset of, you can do this. Persistence pays off. You got to apply yourself. You got to work hard. And, and, and I know it works because I've done it. So. Deborah, other questions? 
I was just going to say to to add to that, we we have to make sure that we understand that all the different ways of learning, one is not superior to the other. My education is not superior to John's education. His is no, just as not. important or meaningful no. as as mine, right? We both do work that is meaningful and fills our yes. souls, I think, probably. Yes. And, and we we have this stupid, uniquely Western idea that a university education is somehow privileged and elite. Indigenous communities have had ways of learning and knowing for centuries that we don't. Appalachia is the same way. We have a different way of learning and knowing. It is not inferior to, nor is a university education superior to. It, it, don't measure my bushel in your basket, right? I, as a matter of fact, I think it, there's one line in the, she almost says it uh, when they're at dinner. She says, don't measure your corn in, in their basket. Do y'all remember that line? I say that all the time. Don't measure your bushel right. in their basket. Well, one of the things I frequently say to our staff and all those of you who know me well know and have heard it many times, there is no high work. There is no low work. There is only work to be done. And we are all capable of doing the work. Yes, we are. Deborah, back to you. Well, we're almost at the end of time. I did want to share a comment. There's no more questions, but there's a comment from DZ who said that they enjoyed this discussion. They hadn't heard of the film before this program. And they say that their grandfather and grandmother moved to Akron, Ohio, Akron, Ohio in the early 1900s, presumably to work in a factory there. And that's where their father was born but they didn't stay too long and moved back to the West Virginia farm where they raised cattle and sheep. And then their father joined the army, but after 20 years, he moved back to the same farm. So Josh, similar to the story of your family and Fran and John, similar to you too, there's something about Appalachia that it's so, it's the one of the richest, most diverse in biodiversity. We've seen that throughout this series, all of the ways in which thinking, ecological study, arts and crafts, applied learning happens and that it draws people to it who aren't from here and it draws people back who, who are born or raised here, who have family here. So. Well, and, and, and the thing about it is, uh, you know, it takes all of us to make the community work. You know, you have to have carpenters, plumbers, in my world, the way I think, carpenters, plumbers, electric, you have to have those. You have to have educated people, or well, you know, college educations. You, you have to have doctors. You have to have lawyers. You have to have all of that to make a community. And if we all work together for a common goal, it will happen. But you know, and many times you don't see that because people in power, just like a, the doctor said there earlier, they want to keep it that way. You know, and, and until everybody realizes as a group, we're in this together. And if we all work together, everybody benefits in the end. One last story before we go. When I was in eighth grade, my stepfather got a job in the steel mill in Youngstown, Ohio. And we moved to Youngstown, Ohio. And... We lived on Water Street, which was facing the Mahoning River. And across the river, you could see the fires and the smoke from these large smelting operations. And in Appalachia, I was an odd kid. I was really odd in Youngstown, Ohio. And Ultimately, the decision was made that we would come back to Tennessee, which is what, what we did. But that, that year is indelibly seared in my brain. I had always loved school. I hated going to school because people made fun of what it looked like. They made fun of the way I talked. They made fun of uh, where I lived. And I had never been that unprivileged before. And I think that probably awakened in me 
this sense for social justice that I have today. Right. What I want to say to everybody who watched the film, who joined us this evening, we hope that over time this will become an ongoing series where we look at who we are and how we came to be here. And we reach out as a university. And if anybody is interested in knowing more about our applied degrees, certainly feel free to, to be in touch. Joshua, I'm glad we finally got to meet yes. Demi in person. And John Polly, it is always a joy to see you. And Lindsay and Deborah, thank you so much. And to our panelists, we are truly, truly appreciative. And to all of you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Fran, for thank leading you, this. Friends. Oh, by the way, my, my youngest kid watched the movie and he's, he's out there listening to all this. Wow. Well, and John, he, he also shared that he thought a uniquely Appalachian or um, maybe iconically Appalachian trait that all of you on the panel tonight displayed was storytelling. <laughs> and that was so much appreciated. He said that all of y'all are great storytellers, which feels like inherently oh. Appalachian as yes, well. Okay. Yes. Oh. It's bona fide Appalachian. We're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Fran said, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, you can find all of these recordings on our YouTube channel and on our website. And you can email me with any feedback and questions. A survey will go out in the next few days and weeks so that you can help us guide the series as it as it progresses and comes back to you. So thanks again, have a wonderful rest of your evening and a happy spring to everybody. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. All. you.